You know, Christmas has always been a very special time of the year for me. In fact, some of the happiest moments in my life are all centered around Christmas. Even during the more difficult periods of time in my life, I've always been able to find my happy place at this time of the year. And today, I'm especially joyful that I get to celebrate this most amazing day on our calendar with each and every one of you. So thank you for being here. And on behalf of myself, my wife, the rest of my family, all of our staff, all of our leaders, all of our volunteers, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Or as our good friends say across the pond, Happy Christmas, right? Now, what exactly does it mean to be happy or joyful, blessed or merry? Those are, those are rather loaded words and they probably, as you noticed even here in our video, they meant different things to different people. Now, if you grew up in, in religion, chances are that you were made to believe that the happy people weren't the church people because church people weren't happy people. So the happy people, they were the outsiders. They were the evil ones and they didn't, you didn't really necessarily want them in the religious circles. But you know, the truth is your relationship with God should produce some of the strongest, most pleasing emotions within you that you've ever experienced in your entire life. But again, if you were raised in some system of, of belief that either directly or indirectly taught you that, that happiness is antithetical to a proper walk with God, or if you went to your religious gatherings only to conclude that if you're having fun in life, you must be doing something wrong. If that's the case, then the subject of happiness is probably confusing for you. So what makes you happy? I want you to think about that for a minute. What would make you happy? Now, some of you in this room could go on all day long about what it is that would make you happy, but there are also those individuals here. I, I know you're in here. You share your stories with me, and you would, you would say that you honestly don't know what it is that would make you happy because the joy of life eludes you. And this actually has not escaped the notice of the would-be profiteers because there is a multi-billion dollar a year industry that is focused on your melancholy and it seeks to market happiness to you in a million different ways. You know, if you do this, if you buy this, if you read this, if you embrace this, if you believe this, if you go to this, you know, you fill in the blank, then you will be happy. You know, turn on the TV. For three simple payments of $79.99, you can be happy. And so, you know, we, we, we make the call, hit the website, drop the card, pay the payments, and we, we suddenly discover it's one more dead-end road on a quest for happiness. You know, there, there is a secret to happiness that's right in front of our eyes. More often than not, happiness is not about what you have. You saw that, some of those people, oh, if I just had this, you know, if I had a million dollars, if I had more money. No, it's not about what you have. Happiness is about who you know. It's about the people around you. You know, as I, I look back over my life, the happiest moments in my life are all centered around people, you know, especially as a, a child, you know, I can go on for hours naming all of the names, but, you know, being at grandma and grandpa's house, smelling the turkey that grandma was cooking, she always cooked turkey, yeah, I love turkey, not eating any turkey tomorrow, it's prime rib at the Mertz household, so, but uh, it'll be turkey for Thanksgiving, but yeah, so it's, it's, Uncle Howard and Aunt Nee and Uncle Bill and Aunt Sandy and Cousin Mike. I mean, it's, it's my brothers, Bob and, and Jeremy, my parents when, when they were around, when they were alive. And, and so I've got all of these people in my life, and that's what made the Christmas season happy for me. I also remember like my very, my very first holiday away from home. When, it, when I turned 17 years old, I couldn't wait to get out of the house and, and uh, be my own person, so I joined the U.S. military. Miscalculation, uh, I wasn't my own person. But 
I went to Navy boot camp in June of 86, and I was in A school in November of 86, and they wouldn't let me take leave. I hadn't been in long enough, and, and school was ongoing. And, but I did get to go spend Thanksgiving with a family off the base, a family that invited people into their house, and they invited some other sailors. I, I didn't know them. I didn't know the other guests, but uh, at least I got to go somewhere. But I got to tell you, I was absolutely depressed. I was so miserable Thanksgiving of 1986 because even though I was with these people, they were not meaningful people to me at the time. And, and it, was, it was a difficult, difficult stay. I, I am fortunate that later that year I did get to go home and, and be with my family for uh, Christmas. But I wanted you to think about this. So, so people bring happiness. They're part of our happiest moments in life. But it's also true that it can be the people that are part of our saddest moments in our life. It, it could be the people in our lives that we wish were not in our lives. We've all got people like that, right? But it, it's most likely the people that for one reason or another, they're just no longer in your life. And that, that makes you sad. That makes us sad. So again, happiness is more about, it's more about who you know. It's not about what you have. Now then, some of you might respond by saying, you know, you, you don't know the kind of people that are in my life, Tom. You, you don't know what they're like. And, and that is true. So I would add to this, it's not just about the people, it's about the relationship that you have with them. And if too many people in your life bring, bring negativity, I, I would encourage you to seek out, seek out circles of friends with, with people that, that actually bring peace and, and joy in, into your life. Seek out those kinds of people. Now, having said all of that, what does any of it have to do with Christmas? Well, I'm so glad that somebody finally asked that question, because I'm going to tell you what it has to do with Christmas. All right, so we've been running around this town for the last few weeks, and just on, on Thursday, my wonderful wife Amy and I were, were driving around town getting, getting last-minute stuff, getting frustrated at all the drivers, and, and, but everywhere you went, everywhere you went, somebody looks at you and they're like, Merry Christmas, right? You, you had that happen? What, what do you do when someone says Merry Christmas? You say, oh, Merry Christmas to you too. Well, what does the word Merry mean in that context? It's a synonym for happy. So whether you realize it or not, you have been making Christmas about happiness, wishing happiness upon people everywhere that you've been going, and they have been wishing happiness upon you as, as well. So, so this is a good time of the year to talk about happiness. Now, Christmas, though, Christmas is the arrival of the who that brings peace between us and God that brings peace inside of us, that brings peace around us, and that brings peace from above us. See, Jesus is the solution to your lack of happiness because he repairs the breach, restores the peace that was taken away that because of our sin, because of that sin that broke the joyful peace that God created the cosmos with. Now, let me tell you something though about Christmas. Christmas the story of Christmas is not something that God conjured up 2,000 years ago. It, 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 it didn't just suddenly occur to God to send his son to earth. And in fact, it goes all the way back, even in our written Bible, it goes all the way back to the very earliest chapters in the Bible, the story of Christmas begins to be told. And the details of Christmas are revealed one by one all throughout the Old Testament. And when we get to the New Testament, to the Gospels, we see the full culmination of all of the promises that God made about Christmas. So I want us to look at a text this morning. This is an ancient passage written by Isaiah, and it shares some of these details about Christmas. Now, these, these comments were written 700 years before there was a, a baby in a manger, during, during a period of time where the world, for most part, did not experience peace. And, and the man, Isaiah, the prophet, he prophetically revealed some details about Christmas, but he also explained the contrast. He demonstrated the contrast because, be, between the world as it was then and realistically as it is now, but also contrasting it to what the world will be like someday because of the, the, the Son of God come to earth in human flesh. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 
through 7 with a short pause in the middle there. It says, verse 1, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Galilee, as you know, is where, where Jesus Christ was from. That is where the land of, of Naphtali and Zebulun was. But Jesus was a Galilean. He's called the Galilean. It goes on and says that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the, the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, that was one of Israel's enemies, the Midianites, he says, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulder, the rod of the oppressor. I, I especially like this right here. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Now, why, why are the instruments of war and the garments stained with the blood of the battle, why, why is it that they're, being, that they're being burned? It's because they're no longer needed. No weaponry will exist beyond this point. No, no accoutrements of war will exist because the world at this time, the cosmos, the spiritual realm, the physical realm, be, will be, be completely restored to the peace in peace for all eternity to come because of Jesus Christ. And, and here's what it's all predicated upon. This is the exciting part of this text. Look at verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Jesus is that promised child of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He, he came to earth to live the perfect life that no human being could, could ever live in order to satisfy his own requirements for absolute righteousness. And then he died the death that every human being deserves to die in order, in order to accomplish his own requirements for absolute justice. He is the wonderful counselor, the one who tells us who, who we are. He is the, the prince of peace, the one who shows us how to live at peace with others. He is the everlasting father, the one that created peace ultimately in his life and in his death and the shedding of his blood between us and God. Now, I want to go back to a text that Matt read to us a little bit earlier, and it's, it's the story of the fulfillment of of what we just read in Isaiah chapter 9. As you know, the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks by night, unsuspecting. There was nothing different about this night in all respects except for one. The Messiah had been born and they didn't even know it. And the, the angels make the announcement. It says that the angel comes to them and, and, he, and he says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will be great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, the city of Bethlehem, David's city, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a, a great company of the, of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. You know, the arrival of Jesus meant peace for the world 2,000 years ago, and it still means peace to the world today. And yes, all we have to do is look around the world and we realize that, that this, this peaceful world that Isaiah described to us, it's not here yet because even though Christ means peace to the world, 
We are still waiting for the day when God will return and restore the world and make perfect peace over it. That day is going to come. The day will come when the kingdoms of this world will have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Can I tell you something? God is not standing in the way of your joy. He isn't. God is the way to joy. To resist God is to resist his happiness, but to devote yourself to God, to delight in him, is to enter into his happiness. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Tom, you don't know how hard my life has been. This is not easy for me. You don't know what I experience in, in daily life, and you don't know how hard my life is even right now. Well, first of all, let me tell you something. I actually, I actually do. Wherever you've been, I've been there too, and I know what those hardships are like, and I can empathize with you in all, all, of, all of your struggles. So I, I do know where you're coming from, and, and you know, I don't doubt that some of you have actually given up on finding happiness in your life altogether. I also know that there are those in this room who choose only to find happiness in favorable circumstances in life. And, and you, you would basically say, I will only be happy when, and then you fill in the blank. Well, if you will only be happy when, then you make yourself the victim of the what behind the when. You make yourself a victim and, and you'll never find your happiness until you can move beyond that. I also know that some of you believe that God himself is the very reason that you lack joy in your life. I mean, if God, would, if God would only do or allow certain things, then you would be happy. Or if he would stop allowing things or he would eliminate things from your life, then, then you would be happy. But, but God does not intervene. Your life continues, and you're not happy with God. And because you're not happy with God, it is impossible for you to enter into his joy, and you don't experience the happiness that God wants for you. And, and if any of that describes any of you, you're in, you are in my prayers. I love you. I care for you. You are in my prayers. And I, I pray that you would find a change of heart in your life, even if you don't find a change in your circumstances. So here's the deal. Happy people are at peace with, with God, with others, and themselves. And the gospel invitation is an invitation to have peace with God, with others, and with yourself. And all of that happens exclusively, ultimately, in Jesus Christ. Now, I know what it's like to have life raging like war around you, above you, and even inside of you. Because for decades of my life, I, I, I struggled with, with, with hardship, with, with, with depression, with, with no peace whatsoever. And fortunately for me, that changed when I turned 21 years old. As a young man, I, 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 I heard the gospel. I went to a church and, and I accepted the, the truth of Jesus Christ. And, and once I did that, all of a sudden, Christmas, Easter, these wonderful days in the calendar began to take shape in my mind, and I understood why it was that Jesus came. And that produced within me a, a, a joy that, that has never gone away. And, and fortunately for me, at that time, I was also invited into a, a, a community, a church, First Baptist Church of Sterling Heights, Michigan, where, where I made all sorts of friends, and, and I learned about Jesus. I learned about God. I, I, I learned how to fellowship with, with others. And, and let me tell you something, if you're looking for that kind of a place, that kind of a family, I, I invite you into our church community. If, this is, if you're a guest here, come back in the coming weeks. Check us out on a other than Sunday, Christmas morning kind of service. Let us, let us shake your hand. Let us get to know you because maybe this is the place where you can find peace with God and community with, with, with others. Now, before I close here, I do have one more question for you. Given what we are learning about the theology of happiness, be it in the weeks prior or if you've only been here today, given what we've learned about happiness, what would make you happier? Now, in a few minutes, we're going to celebrate the candlelit portion of our service. But before we do, 
I want you to do something. Take out this card that was sitting on your seat when you walked in and reach around deeply into the pocket of the seat in front of you or behind you, if you don't mind. I, I would like you to take a moment of reflection. Just remain seated during the next song. Take a moment of reflection and ask that question. Given what I know now, what would make me happier? And I want you to fill that in the blank right on the back. And if you don't mind, after that, also include your name, email, and or a phone number. And when you, when you do that, we're asking you to do that because we want, as a staff, to be able to pray for you specifically by name and for the very thing that you're putting down. We're going to be praying over these cards over the course of the next, next two, three weeks. And uh, I promise you, we're not going to show up at your house and irritate you other than perhaps sending you an email and, and or a text message. But beyond that, we're, we're not going to trouble you in any way whatsoever. And who knows, maybe we would be able to help you somewhere down the line, take, take a next step towards full devotion and full delight in Jesus Christ. And as you're leaving here today, if you don't mind, take these cards right between the front doors as you're leaving the building. There's some baskets there. You can drop them in either one of, of the baskets. And uh, let's go ahead, though, and have a moment of prayer. Lord, thank you so much. Father in heaven, thank you so much sending your son, Jesus Christ, to enter into this world as a baby, but to grow up and live a perfect life and then die a perfect death, also that we could become members of your forever forgiven family as Jesus' forever forgiven followers. Not perfect because we will, we will continue to mess up, but we will be perfectly forgiven all because of Jesus. Thank you so much for this wonderful day and for the memories that, that we're going to take from it. And uh, for those that are maybe feeling a little melancholy this time of the year, Father, I pray that you would just o overshadow them with the power of your Holy Spirit and give them your happiness and help them find that joy even when their circumstances are difficult. We love you, God. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Happy Christmas.